Yes, it's working. Thank you for coming. Welcome to this uh, special event. This is the last uh, public event that we as NIAS, the Netherlands Institute for Advanced Study, are organizing this academic year. Um, I'm Henneke Becker. I'm uh, Head of Academic Affairs at NIAS. And uh, what we do is we host, uh, during a whole year or semester, uh, we host international scholars and scholars from uh, the Netherlands to work on a project that they're really interested in. And uh, we, we, we keep them free from all other obligations so they can really focus. And uh, tonight we will present the work of two of our um, NIOS fellows. Uh, Steps, uh, I have to say it right, Stagiola and Natalia Vins. Um, Steph uh, Scagliola had con has conducted her PhD at the Erasmus Universiteit in Rotterdam uh, on the controversial topic of Dutch war crimes committed during the Indonesian Independence War from 1945 to 1949. And she furthermore has created a digital interview collection of uh, around 1,000 audio interviews with Dutch veterans. Uh, and since 2016, she works as a research associate at the Luxembourg Center for Contemporary and Digital History. Natalia Rin, sitting next to her, she holds a PhD in history uh, from Queen Mary University of London, uh, uh, and, and she has studied uh, itineraries and memories of women veterans um, of the Algerian War of Independence. And Vince is a reader in North African and French studies at University of Portsmouth um, recently. Um, and her main interest lies in um, uh, oral history, gender studies, and state and na nation building in Algeria and France. And so now together they are working at NIA, so they, they have been working and are now finalizing their project um, in a theme group uh, called Comparing the Wars of Decolonization. This was a comparative program in which couples of researchers, international researchers, were, were coupled with Dutch researchers, comparing different wars of decolonization, the French uh, and, and the, in, in Algeria, the Dutch in Indonesia, um, the, the wars in Kenya and Vietnam. And um, the interesting thing of tonight is that um, both um, Steph and, Vi and, and Natalia are both um, area experts and they have now touched upon this, this topic of sexual violence in uh, wars of independence. So uh, tonight it's, it's, it's a way for them to, yeah, to provide insights in their, in their research but also to have a real discussion with you as an audience about what is specific about sexual violence in these areas. And if, if there are people in the audience who are you know, experts in the field of studies on sexual violence, uh, please don't hesitate to really um, engage in the discussion. So um, I would like to um, give you the floor. There will be a, a, about a 40 minute presentation of, of, of together made by uh, Steph and Natalia, and afterwards we will have a Q&A and we will open up the floor for uh, a discussion with you. Okay, thank you. Please, welcome. Thank you very much, Fenneke, for that introduction, and thank you all um, for coming here tonight. <coughs> Um, I'm going to start off by explaining why we're putting side by side uh, the case of the French army um, in Algeria and the Dutch army in Indonesia. And partly it is just by chance because Steph is, is a specialist um, of <coughs> Dutch army in Indonesia and I work on, on Algeria and I've also worked um, on women who participated in the Algerian War of Independence. So to a certain extent, and maybe this is something we can come back to in the discussion, we could have put together a whole variety of different cases and places and tried to draw um, comparisons and also try to find differences. But fundamentally, why are we doing this comparison? The comparison isn't really to produce a chart about similarities and differences. 
The purpose of the comparison is to highlight our blind spots, is to ask questions in a different context, which seem obvious in our context, but perhaps haven't yet been asked in the other place, and vice versa. And it's to shine a light on things that we might not necessarily see by putting two different things together. So hopefully in the course of this evening, we're gonna share with you some of our initial findings um, and, and things that we've learned by comparing these two different places. Um, and perhaps begin to rethink what both of us ha have taken for granted about what we thought we knew about the specialist area we work on. But first we're gonna start off uh, with a clip of something that is taking place now in Syria, and obviously this isn't a war of decolonization, but it is going to introduce the theme of rape during wartime. So the next extract that we're going to show you um, is an interview with the uh, filmmaker who made this film. Um, it's in French, so you might want to look at the translations, which are the first set of translations on the left um, of your sheet. d'instruments, euh, et c'est ce qu'on appelle le viol de C'est vraiment le crime parfait 
elles ne pourront jamais raconter ce qui leur arrive dans les prisons. Quand le régime arrête les femmes et les viols, quand elles sortent, elles sont soit rejetées par leur famille, euh, mises à la porte, soit elles doivent être emmurées dans un silence pour être acceptées. Les citoyens, euh, ils ont pu en parler à leurs amis, ils ont pu en parler à leur famille, ils ont pu choisir le dire, ils ont si vous voulez témoigner. Elles, elles ne peuvent pas parler, c'est vraiment la double peine. C'est une société qui condamne la femme de vérité, on devrait traiter ces femmes comme encore plus des héroïnes que les hommes. Parce que souvent, elles se sont arrêtées à cause de leurs hommes. Voilà. Et elles sont là, elles sont encore debout, malgré toutes les blessures. Et on n'est pas une honte, on est un honneur. Et c'est vraiment ça. Et ce sont des femmes debout, malgré le fait qu'elles sont toutes sous calmant, qu'elles font toutes les tentatives de suicide. Que ce qui les maintient en vie, ce sont leurs enfants. Elles n'ont rien pour survivre, elles n'ont aucune aide psychologique. Qu'est-ce qui nous reste Mourir Mourir en silence. Ce qui se passe dans les choses de Bachar Al-Assad, c'est juste... Voilà, c'est un crime contre le mari. D'après ce qu'on sait, c'est qu'il y a plus de 80% des femmes qui ont été en prison qui sont violées. just shown you these documents, this, these short clips, is of course they have nothing to do with the victimization war, the former conflict, but uh, because uh, it gives you a glimpse of the social psychological impact of such an experience, which is very difficult to get out of a historical source from an archive or from a memoir. Moreover, um, what is important is what um, the Manon uh, Loza later on says, it, that it also shows um, that there is a kind of structure. She later on in the interview talks about how it starts in prisons, and then uh, when it is, it's in the prison, it's recorded with telephones, and this is then spread, and it goes to other soldiers' military, and then it encourages the practice of recording these images and spreading them. So there is also the intervention of the, the structure of, of how this violent act is spread and then put into practice by a broader group. And so this is why we, we wanted to show this, because it, it's persistent along all the different contexts that we've visited. So compared to other violent acts that are that take place during war, rape stands out. And it stands out because most other forms of violence, however abhorrent we find them politically or morally or ethically, armies have found ways to justify them. So armies find ways to justify torture, to justify collective punishment. But rape is always sanctioned, at least in theory, in military law. For a very, very long time, it should, in theory, always be punished. And yet, at the same time, for millennia, rape has been seen as an inevitable part of violent conflict. It's part of the repertoire. Both civilian and combatant women have been seen as a form of sort of sexual booty for conquering soldiers. And as a result, and this is something that you will, will come back to when we start looking at the archives of military justice, Rape has been seen as an inevitable, an unfortunate, but an inevitable result of war. Um, that these are large groups of men, they um, are living in extreme conditions, um, they're sexually frustrated, and that rape is a form of, if you like, sexual release. This is sometimes termed recreational rape. So wartime rape or rape in wartime is seen as the consequence of men's alleged biological need for sexual release. And the idea that men in war need sexual release is reflected in the fact that um, armies provide brothels um, for their soldiers. So military brothels have historically been created with the aim of stopping the rape of civilians, um, stopping homosexuality between soldiers, and also keeping on control on sexually transmitted diseases. Yet, of course, if this argument worked, if rape was just the result of sexual frustration, 
in situations where actually the army did provide brothels, then rape of civilians wouldn't take place. And of course this doesn't happen. We have plenty of examples um, where soldiers have easy access to prostitution and still rape takes place. So this leads us on to two different types of rape. Um, and this sort of typology um, has been developed by the feminist international relations scholar Cynthia Enlo. There's a huge literature on rape on wartime, and we've just decided to focus on Enlo's work here, but there are plenty of other authors that we could refer you to if you're interested. So she also talks about national security rape. So national security rape is used to punish, humiliate, or torture women who are seen as subversive and supposedly a threat to the nation or the state. And the account of the Syrian woman that we opened with is in many ways an example of national security rape. The other kind of rape she talks about is systematic mass rape. And this might be defined as a specific instrument of oppression as a means to humiliate both enemy women, but also to humiliate enemy men by possessing and degrading their women. And we're gonna be deconstructing this idea a little bit later. But the idea is that you undermine sort of the, the family and by extension the nation. And the sort of the classic example, if you like, of this systematic mass rape are the forms of rape that we see in the 1990s in the former Yugoslavia um, and also in Rwanda where um, systematic mass rape is a tool of ethnic cleansing. But there's plenty of examples that, that predate this, um, notably in the wake of the Second World War, where you get systematic mass rape, but that's not necessarily um, part of ethnic cleansing. Um, the, the problem with these um, explanations is that they are actually give a kind of ex they explain a phenomenon, and because of this explanation, it becomes a little bit abstract, it becomes generic. It, it glosses over the individual responsibility of military, um, including the responsibility of bystanders to intervene, to stop, to spread the news. Um, there are possibilities, there are measures to stop this. You have military commanders who can be strict, who can show leadership, who can make sure that they have enough resources, that they have enough... But all these, um, all these explanations about the causes also have a, a, another disadvantage, is that they shift the attention to a problem for the organization, or uh, a symbol of the attack of a nation, like national security. And what they do not talk about is the victim, is the voice of the victim. How is the act perceived? How does this person live her life further? How does it impact the family life, the history, or for, for, does it have a kind of agency within the village where it, it has taken place? And this is, this actually um, um, evades or, or downplays the women as historical actors. And um, now we're going to provide you with some historical context. So we're going away from the national, from the international, from the corporate, back to the history of the regions that we studied. So for Indonesia, I may be laboring the obvious for the people here who know their history well, but um, the Dutch set up commercial enterprises already way back in the 16th century, and these. Um, the only way of succeeding of controlling this territory was by indirect rule, by having allegiances with local feudal elites. And this went on way until the 19th century, and it meant that the first groups to go there were men, were men who had their positions there and who connected and had relationships with local women. So it was a really colony, gender imbalanced colony. This changed in the, at the end of the 19th century when there was an industrialization 
uh, the, the, a, a kind of replication of Dutch society in Indonesia at the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, which meant that factories were built, that companies were set up, so they needed a lot of personnel from the mother country, and with this personnel, the Dutch women came along, so that completely changed the character of the society. It was a kind of reproduction. Then there is a big uh, seizure, gap, crisis, which is the Second World War. Indonesia, the whole archipelago, was uh, occupied by the Japanese under the, 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 the objective of the ideology of Asia for the Asians, but at the same time, the Japanese fully exploited all the Indonesian resources and there were forced laborers. Um, but they supported the claims for autonomy and independence. So when the Japanese capitulated in August uh, 45, immediately after two days, the Indonesian uh, nationalist movement declared its independence. As you well know, this was not uh, uh, appreciated by the Dutch government, who sent in troops. Their idea was a gradual decolonization, and they wanted to restore uh, colonial rule. So, in order to force that gradual uh, decolonization, they sent in 200,000 troops, colonial troops, volunteer and conscripts, and these fought with a predominantly guerrilla uh, asymmetric warfare with the Indonesian forces and this um, uh, was for five years and then in the end the Dutch were forced to hand in sovereignty to the, to the, to the Indonesians. Okay, so now we have uh, the history of Algeria in one slide. Um, again, as Steph said, apologies if you're already very familiar with this. Uh, so the French first conveyed Algiers in 1830, but the colonisation of the northern part of Algeria takes at least 40 years, and the Sahara is not brought under French military control until the turn of the century. Now what makes Algeria very distinct, not just in comparison with Indonesia, but within the context of the French Empire more broadly, is that actually legally it's not a colony, it's considered an integral part of French territory. So the three provinces of Iran, Algiers and Constantine are considered as French, legally, um, as any other province within mainland France. The other specificity of Algeria is that it's a settler colony, so we don't have the same imbalanced gender dynamic as we do have in Indonesia. So very quickly, there are a large number of settlers in Algeria. Not all of them are French. A lot of them come from southern Mediterranean countries, but then they are naturalised as French. In 1954, there are approximately one European, and this is the terminology of the time, for 8.5 French Muslims. So even though Algeria is supposedly an integral part of France, it's not a colony, it functions as a colony. It's a colonial society um, in which the vast majority of Algerians do not have full French citizenship, special laws exist that only apply to them, and they're discriminated against in terms of education, in terms of access to economic uh, and social resources, and in terms of cultural discrimination. In 1940, um, Algeria comes under the collaboration of specie regime when France is divided into two. Um, when the Allies invade North um, land, sorry, not invade, <laughs> depending on one's point of view, North Africa in 1942, um, it becomes the location for one of the ways into the liberation of Europe, and Algeria also becomes the capital of the Free French. On the 1st of November 1954, <coughs> The National Liberation Front launches an armed anti-colonial struggle. And this is an absolutely huge war. This is one of the biggest wars of decolonization of the 20th century. Two million French soldiers uh, go and fight there. They're a mixture of conscripts. There are also some Algerians um, who are in the French army. And there are also some soldiers from Morocco and France's colonies in West Africa. Um, it is a war that wreaks huge devastation upon Algeria, between a third and a half of the rural population of this place, to just give you one statistic. 
And it ends in 1962 with the signing of a peace treaty and Algerian independence in July of that year. So in terms of the colonial context, um, what is very noticeable about both Algeria and Indonesia, um, and actually in colonial contexts elsewhere too, um, is that one of the ways in which colonial rule is exercised is through the objectification of the bodies of <coughs> colonised people, and in particular, colonised women. And some scholars have argued that this is an accelerating factor, if not the sole factor, in explaining rape and sexual violence. So, since the late 19th century, colonial people uh, were exhibitions, so there are colonial exhibitions which take place uh, across Europe in which it's the bodies of colonised people who are put on display. There's extensive sex tourism, and there's a huge production, particularly in the French <coughs> case, of pornographic images of colonised women. And one of the favourite stereotypes is of, of a veiled woman with bare breasts. So the idea that the veil is mysterious and uh, slightly exciting and uh, the French man is encouraged to peek underneath. So in the context of the debate of the Algerian War of Independence, this was actually a theme that Algerian nationalists engaged with at the time. And the most commonly sort of cited person on this theme is Franz Fanon, who many of you uh, I'm sure will be familiar with. Um, he is the West Indian psychologist, uh, writer. He's also a member of the Algerian National Liberation Front, and he actually writes um, in their newspaper. And he depicts European men's rape of Algerian women as the logical consequence of colonial domination. When we go to the Indonesian context, the most cited scholar who writes about the sexual relationships in the colonies is Anne Stoller in her seminal work, Carnal Knowledge and Imperial Power. And she's inspired by Said Orientalism and uh, she um, presents the concept of the uh, asymmetry in the sexual relationships with the powerful European men and vulnerable local women. And she sees this as a kind of metaphor for power relationships in general in the colonies. And you see that the colonial authorities are very concerned about a racial degeneration. So that on the one hand, they're very strict and they try to set boundaries between, uh, they, they don't want that the, 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 the Europeans mingle with the local population. On the other hand, and I think that may be also a, 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 a reflection of Dutch stinginess, they don't want to pay military who are married have higher pays, get higher pays. So in order to evade that, they, in, they encourage concubinage. So the military have um, are not allowed to marry, so the, I'm talking about the rank of not the officers, are not allowed to marry, but they can have a local women who will take care of them when they're sick, cook food, and provide sexual services. But she has no right whatsoever. And this is called the tanksi, the barrack. And this was the place where you could find uh, women. On the other hand, you also have a very sexualized um, uh, images of uh, Javanese, specifically Javanese women, and they were uh, presented as uh, promiscuous. Uh, here you have this warning in Dutch, be aware of these women because they will be, the, they are available at the young, for the young men, and they have this idea that if they have sex with young men, they will stay younger, they will become younger, and this will ruin the personality of these young men. So this was one way in which these women were dangerous. At the same time, you had the women as the caretaker, the babu. You see here the babu, she took care of the children. And there are, is enormous literature of nostalgic uh, people with the youth in the Netherlands Indies who think back of the babu, babu and even have more connections to the Babu than to their own mother. 
So there is this duality in, in, in the role of women. And if we go to the military context, then we see the Babu in the barracks, that instead of taking care of the children, she takes care of the military. By the way, the reason why we put these black spots on these photographs is, is symbolic, because of course if you go on the internet and Google something, you will get the same images. It's just that we have decontextualized these images by taking them from a specific context and placing them in our presentation about sexual violence. That is something that affects the way, so if one of you would have a grandfather or grandma, so who is on that picture, that wouldn't be appropriate. So we want to point to the fact that this is an important feature of digital technology and the web and getting photos very easily. So this is why we, uh, we put these white spots. So going back to Babu, um, she was a, a phenomenon, part of the colonial legacy. And um, we don't want to suggest by pointing to this context that these relations were always violent. There were a lot of conceptual relationships. In fact, together with someone else, I co-wrote a book on these conceptual relationships, on love relationships, in which a lot of children were fathered that were later abandoned in Indonesia. And, but beside these consensual relationships, the unbalanced power between the Babu and the military led to all kinds of cases of abuse. And this has also to do with the... Um, with, um, um, so we, we, with the places where they were, because there was a kind of intimacy in the barracks. And one of the uh, measures that commanders would take with Babus is that they would pay them and they would have a medical checkup and they were available for the boys. And the reason why they did it was to prevent the military from going to the prostitutes because if the prostitute was danger, they would get venereal disease. So this was a way of controlling the sexuality of the troops. And um, so in the Algerian context, uh, we don't have the figure of the bubble, so French soldiers cook and clean uh, for themselves. Um, we do have a system of military brothels in which women are vetted and also tested for sexually transmitted diseases by the French army. Um, we also don't really have the figure of the bubble as someone that takes care of the family. Of course, Algerian women did look after people's children, clean houses. Um, but the idea that then these women would be employed to provide sexual services is not something that exists in the Algerian context. And as Steph said, it's not because we're assimilating all kinds of sexual, uh, sexual relationships with rape, but it's to give you an idea of the sexual politics of both of these countries that we're looking at. These are countries in which the bodies of colonised women have been fetishised, have been objectified, and have been seen as sexually available for a long time. Afterwards, then can we connect that to instances of rape during wars of decolonisation? That is another question, and to a certain extent, we haven't got an answer to that question, um, but we are going to tell you a little bit about what we have found out. So we're going to talk to you a little bit more now about our sources and why it's significant that we know what we do, and why it's also significant what we don't know about places and spaces, um, about the politics of rape. So how was rape understood at the time, particularly by nationalist movements? And then finally, we're going to move on to the question of redress. So what possibilities did and do victims have for redress? So I'm not going to spend too long on the sources, and we can come back to those in question, but we've been looking at the archives of military justice in both the Dutch and the French case. And unsurprisingly, rape is underreported, underinvestigated, and under-prosecuted. So we're looking at relatively few cases of rape. Um, we've actually got more evidence in the Dutch case than the French one, but that perhaps says more about the state of the archive than anything else. And then the other type of source we're using is both contemporary accounts and memoirs. Um, and I'm just going to flag up two things in this list here. So firstly, the Jumil Bupasha case, which is a case of rape that takes place during the war and is known about and is documented. 
and secondly the Tremini case in Indonesia which is something which comes to light much later in 2014 and we're going to be coming back to both of those shortly. Yes, when we're talking about places and spaces there are several instances that in which uh, the opportunities for rape to be um, to, to occur, to be um, acted upon, are, are, are specific. And one of these is the military sweep. To understand what a military sweep, we need a, a kind of brief sketch of the guerrilla warfare. It's an asymmetrical warfare in which you have um, um, a rich with good resources, an army with, which is with the military police that is paid by taxpayer with rules which is controlled and on the other side you have loosely organized uh, militias with a lack of resources but a lot of men so the, the in, in terms of quantity and, and they call it total war, war for them it's the main objective is getting independent at the cost of anything whereas the other part the, the regular army has to try and abide to some rules. Well, what happens in a irregular, in an asymmetric warfare? There is a constant push of small units of men who have to search territories, the rural population, and have to make sure that the rural population doesn't support the guerrillas. So they will search houses, they will search villages, and they will interrogate it's sometimes very violently people, and they will abuse people, and in many of these instances, uh, the women or older men that they find in these places are alone because they are not protected by their own men. So this is kind of the context. And a military sweep is something different than a patrol. And a patrol is very often initiated by a unit in a barrack that is housed nearby, so very often they know the environment, they know the villages. The sweep comes from somewhere else and is directed into a, to, into a, a, ve a very vast area. And here you can see how these military are in line and they have to go through a territory and shoot and then they come into the near a village and they uh, circumvate, surround the village. So this is the, the, the context of a military sweep. And here you can see a kampong house, which is made of bamboo, so it's very vulnerable. You can open the door at once, it's not very... And here I will want to cite a, a quote from a court case. During a patrol in Sukhobirio, all men were brought together. The perpetrator seek the opportunity to abuse Karti. You see this division. Um, and pointed his gun at the 10-year-old Carty, put it then aside and raped her. So in that quote you can see actually a lot of the cases we're looking at, um, they're not actually rapes of women, they're rapes of children. Um, and in part that could be because those are the cases that, that make it to court, but that is one of the things that we have found again and again. This is an extract from the diary of Mulut for Aoun, who was an Algerian teacher, and he's describing what he saw in his region of Kabylia in 1957. Women remained in the villages at home. They were given orders to leave the doors open and to stay isolated in the different rooms of each house. The village was thus transformed into a populous military brothel into which the mountain infantry and other legionnaire companies were unleashed. And in the accounts of women um, in villages who describe um, being raped, there's a very similar pattern that emerges. So first of all, the soldiers will come, they will surround the house, um, then they will break into the house. So the first space that they violate is the space of the home. Then they will make women undress, they will start um, insulting them using sort of very sexualized insults. Then they will start conducting body searches and there's all kinds of theories about things you need to check on an Algerian woman's body to check they're not hiding anything. And then you can see very clearly when you know, a woman is naked and having her genitals searched that she's already very, very vulnerable to rape. And we can see a similar pattern 
of making women vulnerable um, in the kinds of rapes that take place in custody. Um, so one of the particular features of the Algerian War of Independence is actually the mass participation of women in the nationalist movement. So often uh, they are arrested, often they find themselves in French custody, and often rape takes place after being stripped, after being insulted, and after being tortured. And we're just going to show you uh, this extract here, the translation um, of which is on your Louisette est agent liaison pour agent liaison pour le FLN. Son nom de guerre est Lila. Toute sa famille est engagée dans la lutte pour l'indépendance. Sa mère, ses sœurs ont aussi été torturées. Plus que les coups, Louisette craint son père qui lui a dit « Je préfère te savoir morte que parlant sous la torture ». Alors, face à son tortionnaire, Lila se tait. Ça a commencé par des gifles, des coups de poing, et puis des grossièretés avec tous les noms donc beaucoup, beaucoup, beaucoup. Bon, ça a commencé comme ça. Et puis après, monsieur a débordé. Il a... Il a... Il, il commettait l'île normale. Vous n'arrivez pas à, à mettre des, des mots là-dessus Bon, qu'est-ce qu'on peut faire Une femme, vous savez, c'est très... Une femme... Le viol, c'est tout. D'une façon très, très violente. C'est tout. C'est beaucoup. Et c'est pour ça que je ne pardonnerai pas. C'est pour ça que je ne pardonnerai pas à quelqu'un qui, qui puisse humilier à ce point. C'est de l'humiliation, hein. c'est pire ça. À, à la limite, j'aurais préféré des tortures, euh, enfin, j'aurais préféré la gégède, j'aurais préféré les bigoires, j'aurais préféré, je ne sais pas, les coups, les insultes, les injures, les crachats, et puis les beaux grossiers, là, ça, j'ai, enfin, je m'attendais à tout cela, mais pas au viol. Contrairement à ce que prétend Osares, il y a... Le général aussi. Yes. Um, as I was already mentioning in the earlier slides and part of the stories, uh, in the Indonesian uh, context, uh, many of the cases that I came across Yeah, sorry. Evolved around the intimate atmosphere of the dormitory, the washing room. You can see here how these the boys are in shorts. They are bare. There, there is a kind of uh, bodiness. There is a kind of uh, culture in the barracks in which uh, it's very informal. And the babus are everywhere in the dormy. They they change their uniform. They're oh, it's very sweaty. They wash their uniform two times a day, often, and uh, for every uh, five to eight military, there was a babu. And if you think of two hundred thousand military, so there were a lot, a lot of these women. Um, It also happens very often at night or in the evening, and very important, it's in their free time. So the babus are at work, but the military are not in service, they are in the barracks. And so um, I want you to, I wanted to show a quote from one of the court cases, um, which indicates exactly the setting. So the perpetrator who was drunk went to bed, dirtied his bed, called for the babu to clean, and then attacked her and raped her. And in fact, in many of the other cases which I come across in the archives, 
there are, besides the succeeded rapes, there are a lot of sexual assaults in which comrades intervene and, and they stop a drunken military from, uh, from uh, doing so. So as uh, Steph just mentioned, alcohol uh, is often quite an important um, factor in rapes that take place outside of operations, so outside of interrogation and outside of military sweeps. Uh, so in the French archives, those cases that are prosecuted tend to be for indiscipline. Uh, sometimes we're not sure if the soldier is getting prosecuted for leaving his post, um, being drunk, and then the fact that he has gang raped uh, four or five women along with two other soldiers is almost incidental. But we have a, a, a number of cases of, of where rape takes place, where soldiers have sort of sneaked out, gone into the surrounding countryside um, and attacked uh, and raped women and girls. So now we go to politics. Uh, and here it is important the parentheses around not, not framing rape. What we see here is a photograph of the young uh, Abdul Haris Nasution, a very famous general of the Indonesian Revolution, uh, who was also the theorist of the um, uh, guerrilla warfare. He wrote a book about the whole construction of how he led the army, how he constructed the attacks or the whole theory of organizing the people. And he held a war diary, and in this war diary you can read um, about uh, a Dutch patrol in the Pasitayu, and he mentions the rape of women. Huh? They did not hesitate to violate the honor of women. And then the war diary carries on in a very casual way about troops moving and having weapons, and it almost in passing by, there is no indignation, there is no uh, moral or eth ethical appreciation of this violent act. And um, this is in contrast to the Algerian case. Um, and here you see a, a quote from the French feminist, the very famous French feminist, Simone de Beauvoir. Um, and this is a text she actually wrote in 1960, it's published in book form in 1962. Um, a 23-year-old Algerian FLN liaison agent is tortured and raped with a bottle by French soldiers. It's banal. And what she's underlining here, Simone de Beauvoir, that actually the rape of women, and indeed the rape of men with objects, was banal during the Algerian War of Independence. But it was made not banal by Algerian nationalists and also by their sort of supporters um, amongst a certain group of French intellectuals. So in 1960, uh, Jamila Bupasha, who we see there here um, on the left, the woman on the right is Simone de Beauvoir, um, was arrested uh, by the French army. She was tortured and she was raped with a bottle. But when she was brought before the military tribunal, um, unlike many other people who had previously been brought before the military tribunal, she, she managed to say that she had been raped and she demanded to see a doctor. And then, as a result of that, she was examined by a doctor who sort of dismissed her claim, and then there was a second examination. But more significantly, her lawyer uh, was Giselle Halimi, who was a Jewish Tunisian uh, lawyer, who was a supporter of sort of the anti-colonial cause. And together with a whole other group of sort of French intellectuals, she really publicised Jamila Pasha's case. That was not directly to try and find the person responsible for this and you know get them brought for military court. It was actually part of a strategy um, to defend Jamu Pasha who was on trial, but also as a means to delegitimize uh, the French state on the world stage. Because really the key thing also about guerrilla warfare is the smaller power, the guerrillas, they know that they can't just win militarily, they have to win politically as well. And part of that process of winning politically is demonstrating the illegitimacy of the presence of the larger power. And really the violence and against Algerian women and children, the rape of Algerian women, became an important tool for the FLN 
as part of their strategy to delegitimize uh, the French presence um, in Algeria. And the other thing that's quite important to point out is we're looking at two different periods in time. So in Indonesia, we're looking at 45 to 49, which is just after the Second World War. In Algeria, we're almost a decade later. And in terms of chronologies, the Algerian war to a certain extent is more connected to the 1960s, to, to, to May 68, to debates uh, about sexuality and feminism um, than it, it is connected to the Second World War, but it's closer to those later debates than the Indonesian cases. And quite significantly, later, Jamil Pasha's lawyer, Gisèle Halimi, would be the person who in France would go on to get the definition of rape changed. Um, so it was a much broader definition than the very narrow one that actually dated from the Napoleonic Code that was in place until the late 1970s. Yes, so you can see, clearly see the complete absence of this element in the negative propaganda on the Indonesian side with regard to the Dutch. They have a very legalistic uh, discourse. They refer to the Roosevelt Doctrine, the right to self-determination, the Dutch were violating this Dutch. They tried to get the help of the UN, of the United States. Uh, but this argument is completely absent. And when they want to portray this negative view of the Dutch, they compare them to Nazis, because we've just had the Second World War. So the Indonesian propaganda is full of references to Nazi and to occupation, which is, is, is a striking difference with what we see in the Algerian context. Um, now we move on from politics to redress, but before we tackle the ways in which victims could voice their experiences, a very important factor, which is never mentioned in the historical context, it's mentioned in the human rights um, uh, movements, in the NGOs, in, in the political, is actually talking about the impact on the women. What happens to women who are raped? Depending on the violence with which it happens, they become infertile, they have damage to their genitals, uh, incontinence. Socially, they are rejected by their next of kin. Uh, they suffer of this psychological trauma. They dislike sex. And very, at the moment, the most imminent impact is venereal disease. Uh, very often in circumstances in which they do not have access to medical care. And the same applies to unwanted pregnancies and the complication of abortion. So there is a lot to deal with. And we, we, just, we think of these things when we think of the, the, the Mwanga who won the Nobel Prize for helping women who were raped. So we think of Congo, Rwanda. But, but when we think back, uh, to the decolonization toward these instances, these elements are, are, are not in view, are, are not visible. So we're going to come uh, at the end um, to legal redress, but in terms of redress at the time, as, as we've already um, said, that they are very limited, um, so most women don't go and report cases of rape, and if they do, very little is likely to happen. But this doesn't mean that women don't have agency. Um, they have very few means at their disposal to defend themselves against rape and sexual assault, um, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't consider them as historical actors. So in Algeria, women talk about attempting to put off potential rape, rapists by covering themselves in dirt, in animal excrement. These photos are very famous. Um, they're a series of photos done by a French military photographer who was given the task of um, taking photos for identity cards of Algerian women. And they obviously didn't want their photo taken for identity cards. They had very little choice about it um, because they were being forced to do it by the military. Um, but you can see that even when someone has no power, um, that doesn't mean that actually they are submitting. Um, and you can see this is a sort of very powerful look um, in this woman's eyes. Um, in terms of uh, what families do, what communities do uh, with victims of rape, this is actually a anthropological study um, carried out in the region of Kabylia, so in the same region 
as well, Mourad Faraoui described mass rapes in 1957, um, in which basically um, families have, have chosen to forget. Um, they've decided not to talk about it because that's the safest thing to do with its history. And we've got an extract now that is a little bit long, it's about five minutes long, but I think, I think it's worth watching it. And it's from a film from 2015, so it's a fiction film, um, but it is a historical drama, really. And it's a film called uh, Lorani, The Man from Iran in English. Um, and in this film, this is the story of a man who goes and he joins the guerrilla movement, he leaves his wife behind, um, and then he comes back after independence and everything around him has changed. And his wife has died and he discovers that he has a son. And one of the key themes um, in the story um, is that there is doubt over the paternity of this son. Is it his child or is it the child of a French soldier um, who raped his wife? And this is very sort of powerful representation, if you like, of how difficult it is to tell your story, but also how difficult it is for someone else um, to tell your story to you. So this is a, a representation. He's gone to the theatre, basically, and a local group has decided to put on a show um, in his honour, and we see uh, his reaction. <laughs>
going to finish off uh, with another um, short video clip, um, which is about an example of redress in the Dutch courts, um, which actually was the trigger for this whole research programme. But just uh, very briefly, since the 1990s, there's been a far greater understanding of rape as a weapon of war. And that has given way to a number of court cases, both in France, uh, in relation to Algeria, and in the UK in relation to Kenya. And in 2012 in the UK, there was a, 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 a condemn, condemnation in civil court and also compensation for three members of the Mau Mau um, who were victims of torture and sexual violence. In the Algerian case, this has been made much more difficult by a series of amnesties uh, that the French government has put in place since 1962. Um, but nevertheless, there are one or two cases by trying to work around the language of the law where some people, including Louise Hilares, who we saw in the previous video, has had some redress through the courts. Two seconds. Two minutes. Two minutes. Oh, two minutes. Yes. Um, so not two seconds. Two this is the, a, a very famous case. Is in the, the Termini case. is a case of rape. Uh, in which um, the, the Dutch state was accused, was, was challenged, and they, um, and this lady, 85 year old lady who was raped at the age of 18, got compensation. And for the sake of brevity, I will skip the, her testimony, and we will go straight on to the victorious part of the story, which is, um, the 8 o'clock news uh, on the Dutch television, um, a moment of fame for these victims. In Nederlands Indië hebben Nederlandse militairen destijds vele burgers geëxecuteerd. De Nederlandse kapitein Westerling heeft achteraf de schuld op zich genomen. Al die daden die onder mijn bevelen gestaan hebben. Neem ik persoonlijk op mee rekening. De slachtoffers, vooral mannen, liggen onder andere op deze erebegraafplaats. De weduwe en nabestaanden hebben volgens de rechter recht op schadevergoeding. Het is nog een hele zoektocht wie deze personen precies zijn en wie dus recht heeft op schadevergoeding. Nu heeft zich dus een vrouw gemeld die verkracht is in 1949 door Nederlandse militairen. Haar man was er niet, die was naar het Rijksveld, dat zei ze tegen de Nederlandse militairen. Dat werd uh, niet geloofd, of althans, uh, daar kreeg ze haar eigen straf voor. En is toen door vijf Nederlandse militairen uh, achtereenvolgens uh, verkracht. Volgens de rechter is er voldoende bewijs voor en is de Nederlandse regering daarvoor verantwoordelijk. De staat moet hebben geweten dat Nederlandse militairen zich, zich destijds schuldig hebben gemaakt aan dit soort misdragingen. De opluchting is groot. Ik vind het gewoon helemaal geweldig dat die verjaringstermijn eigenlijk van tafel is gefeed. Dat hoorde ik door de rechter. En ik vind, ja, het recht heeft gesproken. Het is een doorbraak dat de Nederlandse regering nu niet alleen verantwoordelijk is voor de executie van mannen destijds, maar ook voor de verkrachting van vrouwen. Nou, het zal niet zo zijn dat vrouwen zich nu massaal zullen melden, want velen leven niet meer, of ze durven er absoluut niet mee voor de dag te komen. Er zijn er genoeg. Ze willen er niet over hebben. Tot wij achterkomen wie er precies zijn. En dan gaan wij heel rustig langzaam met de personen die over hebben. So we're going to end it there. Sorry, we wasted a bit of time at the start with some technical issues. Um, and we will leave you so you can read uh, Mrs. Tremony's um, testimony. And we're going to sit down over there. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you both for a wonderful and very rich and also, um, yeah, and, and a, a, in, in some, a somewhat difficult um, uh, topic to, to deal with, especially, I'm, I'm not sure if, that's, if, if you have a similar experience, especially because it is a topic that is so often silenced and, and for the victim so hard to talk about, to talk about something that victims of rape, um, uh, yeah, it, for them it's so hard to talk about. To talk about it, it also feels a little bit twisted in a way. And at the same time, so before I open the floor, I, I would like to, to ask you both a question and, and, and uh, ask you to respond to this. So, 
So what comes to the fore in all the stories of the of the women you've you've shown, and also in your in your analysis and and the stories, um, is this role of the family and the community in silencing or excluding the women that have become a victim of rape. Um, to what extent do you think that? Um, so in a way you 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 you, you, um, you showed how persistent or how how structural this this type of violence is. Do you think that when you talk about how families treat victims, that there is something that we can change? Perhaps not on the side of the soldiers in extreme situations, but perhaps on the side of families and communities silencing silencing women, which makes it so effective to rape women? Well, as, as I, we stated at the beginning, we are, we are not experts on how in the social sphere this is dealt with, which mechanisms work, but just as a regular audience, we do know that giving the Nobel Prize uh, to someone who is working with does create a lot of agency and I think this was also his scope. I, don't, I can't remember his name. But, so I think that um, challenging uh, the taboo on rape is something that is ongoing policy. Mm -hmm. I believe that the UN or the military deployment are very conscious of this. Um, yeah, I mean, um, what I would say from speaking to both women, including Luisa Hilales, who's been public, spoken very publicly about her rape, and women who haven't spoken about it publicly, yeah. is silencing is not necessarily a bad thing. It can be a strategic mechanism for both women themselves and for their family and, and their community. Um, and also, as we've seen, not all, not all the time were cases silenced, so people, people did talk about it. Whether if we talked about it more, it will become less practiced, I don't think so, because I think when we look at sort of multiple explanations and, uh, for, for why rape takes place, shame is just one of them amongst many, unfortunately. So, are there any questions? Question of or a remark just uh, about uh, this. So um, uh, there are a lot of consequences for the women, but um, there must be have been born a lot of children of it. And what does it mean to silence for the children? These children are unwanted. Yes, I don't know whether you heard about Claudia Carr. She has written also a lot about rape in war. And she says that that has not only to do for individual uh, women. There are lots of women, and so also uh, now a lot of uh, children who have been born from it. And and what does it do with the identity of a whole groups of children who are now uh, adults? Yes, uh, to have been born unwanted. So, we don't really, because in the Algerian case, we don't know how many children were born as a result of rape. Um, in a very superficial, simplistic way, you wouldn't necessarily know by looking at a child that their father was a French soldier. So there is a way in which it can be masked within communities, because the child wouldn't necessarily look that much different from its brothers or sisters in a really simplistic way. There is one case that we know about, and that's the case of someone called Mohammed Gun, and he was born, um, there was massive population displacement during the Algerian War of Independence, and rural populations were moved into camps to, to basically sort of free up the countryside to be bombed by the French army. And women and children were very vulnerable to being raped in there, so his mother was a teenager, and she was raped and then beaten while she was in the, in the camp and he was born. He was given up for adoption um, 
um, but that could have also been because his mother was very young. He was adopted by quite a well-known Algerian sort of literary couple. The adoption failed, and then he had you know various sort of psychological problems, wondering also who his father was, because he then discovered the person he thought was his father was infertile, so he couldn't be his father. And eventually his mother, he found his mother living in the cemetery, and his mother told him, I stay here because dead people are, are not going to hurt me in the way that the living did. And she told him that her father was a French soldier. And after a very, very long time, and actually his lawyer was the son of Gisèle Halimi, so you can see that actually the lawyers engaged in this, there's a real sort of family commitment too managed to um, basically take the French state to court and he got a pension, a very small one, as a victim of war. But that is the only publicly very well-known case that we know about. But you're right, there must have been a lot of children. <clears throat> Thank you very much. There's a lot to tell about it, but I wanted to also to react on why is there shame and why is the family uh, reacting? And I think what I didn't hear, but maybe that is also this study can be used for, is that underlying the violence and sexual violence in, in war is also the underlying gender power relations in society. And so it brings that you can humiliate men by raping their women because of that uh, unbalanced uh, power relation, that you can punish women when they don't act as a woman should do. And that it's even as a premium for the soldier when he wants the war. It has all to do with the position of women in the society. And that's also why the victim women don't find the support of their community because the shame is based on those relationships. And I think these studies, how can we use it to look today? Because this situation is still occurring. I think it's great that we recognize the rape of Dutch soldiers, of women in Indonesia, but today it's still uh, doing. The UN cannot solve this problem of the blue helmets. And it's still working and, and, and women don't have the voice and are still raped. So how can we look at ourselves, how we still look at women and men in society? So to really be aware how we all also in, in the normal daily routine, when we talk in the Netherlands about rape of a woman, I said, but her short shirt, or what did she do, her attitude was not nice, that is the basis also of more violence also in, uh, in, 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 uh, uh, in war and uh, specific situations. So how, can you, how do you see your research can help us to solve this uh, situation of today, the 21st century? Think something about that because the first thing which happened to me personally is that I grew aware of the fact that I never looked into it. So I'm, I'm. That is one of the advantages of getting older, that you think back. And I, I've, I've, I've written about the debate about veterans' memories, and until we met an indigenous project, I never thought of this, because you think of rape, oh, that's what did happen in Berlin, in Germany, oh, that's what happened with the comfort women in Asia, and you never pose yourself the question, yes, but what about Dutch military? And then there is this question, when is something historically relevant, when it occurs on a big scale, but when do you know whether it occurs on a big scale? First, you have to do research. So, it starts by um, how to say, not taking certain things for granted. That there it starts, and then you can you could come to the conclusion that it was a minor thing, but you first have to do research. I would just add, I'm afraid we haven't got any big answers to, to that question, but also the intersections of race, the gender, um, and the way in which these women are not just in an unequal power relationship because they're women, but also because they're colonised women. So yeah, it's really important to say. And the fact that Julia Beck is still this very controversial is a big problem in the Netherlands. A two questions. Um, for anyone in the room who's interested in the subject, two twin sisters from Amsterdam have documented uh, a rape in uh, Eastern Congo. Uh, a weapon of War is a nice documentary uh, to uh, link up 
military with uh, the women they raped and then apologizing and uh, things like that. Uh, question number one, uh, abortion was mentioned, how uh, easy was it to access abortion? So, uh, second question, you were talking about um, uh, military who were preventing uh, other uh, soldiers who were drunk to misbehave. Is that, um, yeah, how much value do you, do you give uh, considering the context to this kind of stories? Thank you. Well, I was purely referring to the descriptions uh, of the accusations and the verdict of the judge in court cases. So they describe, they have to describe the scene of the crime. So th these were these people were there. Then this happened. Then this happened. And then this happened. And what is described is uh, there was this guy uh, from a from a different unit who came came to fix some cars. But then it turned out he was not only interested in cars but also in our babus, and he shot himself. He he locked himself up there, and she started to scream. And then we ran there to save her in time. And and one remark which is very pointed is that he said this is very up polite to do that with babus from another unit. <laughs> there are babus. Is this reported by a woman or by a military? This is reported by the, the, the judicial authorities that dealt with this crime. So when the cases go to military justice they have to be investigated, so witness statements are collected, and including witness statements from, from women themselves. That said, when you read all of these reports, you can see the prejudices of the time, which still persist today, uh, about you know how the woman might be at fault, or, or maybe it was consensual because she didn't scream enough, and things like that. So obviously they all have to be deconstructed. But in this particular case, it is brought to court because someone has interrupted something going on. So I think probably... And it's very... And it's very all, the, all the instances in which it is interrupted are around... The, that I found are around the barracks. So the gang rape during the military sweeps are different. There you have a different structure. There you have a group of men who take turns. So there it's, it's, it's really different. And the abortion then? Very rudimental, not in hospital or anything like that, um, but things of like herbs and, and sort of local remedies. Yes, I, I don't know much about it. I know that there are stories that local women knew how to deal with that, that they had some, in fact, herbs or, or treatments. And But um, I know that I've studied consensual relationships and the amount of children that they weren't raped but they were taken care of and the amount of children were, was massive that are still there and that you can see them in the villages because the, all the, the, the other people are very uh, I say, thin and, and subtle and then you suddenly you see this one person with a very broad and strong, who doesn't, who, who obviously has a different descent. Oh, so I have a couple of questions. A couple of years ago there was this, uh, in the wake of the, the Delhi uh, bus raid, there was uh, this ongoing debate within radical and leftist circles about what it, we were calling the class versus gender debate in rape uh, and sexual violence. And uh, basically the argument was on the one side, uh, Maya John was talking about a class understanding to sexual violence, whereas the, the gang, bang, bang, gang bang in Delhi was due to a classes, unequal class relations within uh, Indian society, whereas the other one saying, no, it's the feminist understanding of uh, rape as a way to um, can, uh, uh, rape as a way of uh, um, reproducing gender relations and maintaining unequal relationships between men and women so it was very interesting this race versus gender uh, debate whereas uh, afterwards 
of course, in your case, you are talking very much about the racial underpinnings of empire and colonization and decolonization were and how gender plays into that, like gender race. But I was wondering like, if for you it would be useful to introduce class mechanism and class as a concept which makes sense of it and introduce the way race, uh, rape is happening within the, the different way how the Dutch structure their army and the way the Algerians structure their army, both the front, the FNL, but also the French uh, army. and the, uh, So basically the relationships between colonial officers, between their soldiers, who the, the soldiers were. You can still talk a, a story about women by also positioning them within the, the field of power. And my other question is like, do you think that these differences you notice within uh, rape, for example, the military sweeps and the relationships and rapes of the baboos outside of operations, are this can be explained by the, the um, degrees of imperial control and the way how uh, the Dutch did empire compared with how the French did empire? So would you say the differences you notice in your case are the, due to different differences in uh, degrees of imperial control and imperial sovereignties and the way how each empire organized sexuality and desire. Sorry. Those are two really excellent questions. But it's uh, two, two uh, minutes uh, uh, before we have to end, so I would like to collect two other questions I see. Uh, Thank you very much. Um, so in terms of uh, comparing uh, uh, yes, situations where rape occurs in wars, are there also situations where there is no rape? Because I'm getting a bit the impression that it's part and parcel of war and men in, 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 the, in a group uh, under certain circumstances, um, in a certain uh, hierarchy, um, etc., etc. So um, do you know of any uh, yeah, places in Indonesia or Algeria where, or in other countries where you know, structurally, there were things different so that uh, you can compare and maybe see what you can do to prevent these things from happening. To take it away? Take it away from the individual uh, that, you know, cross the board line. Let's answer briefly to address these two questions and then we have two other questions. So I'll briefly start with the last one. Um, and there is a literature on that, so there are, and I will find and I will send you the references, but there is a literature on context, mostly done in South America and Sri Lanka, of actually political movements that are extremely violent in all kinds of ways, but actually don't use rape, rape as a weapon of war. Um, and there is work um, on that. Um, I'm going to leave the question on degrees of imperial control to Steph and uh, very uh, briefly answer your very complex and very important question. Um, the challenge that we have is that we know who the soldiers are if they're in the archive. We can work out who they are, we can work out their social class, for example. And we know who the women are when we have their testimony, but in no case do we have the same account and know who all of the people are at, all the, same, at, at the same time. We can sometimes guess, but the, the challenge is, is working out from a specific case how all of those things sort of interplay. One of the things that, that is quite striking in, in, well not quite striking, it's not particularly surprising, in both of our cases is that one of the groups that is particularly blamed for rape in Algeria are Algerians in the French army. Um, and in part, sometimes that's because they're working within their own community, so they know people, they know which doors to knock on, and they know which women to target, and that could be because they're settling at quite local schools as well. But in part, it's because of the kinds of operations that they're used on. So they're not dropping bombs out of the sky, they are the people on the ground. So it's just because those are the people there at that particular point in time. Yes, I want to second that with regard to the leasing complex, because ethnicity within the colonial forces is an important element. And that ethnicity, um, and this is still a hypothesis, but in the special forces uh, that are applied, uh, deployed in, 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 in difficult areas where there's a lot of resistance, there are a lot of ethnic soldiers who come from different parts of Indonesia than where they, the places where they are deployed. And there are grievances, and there are oppositions, and these are exploited. 
And there is another element with regard to class. What I see in the diaries is that officers get Eurasian women or white women because they're, have, they're, they're higher. So especially in free time, in spare time with dancing or they get all the, if they want to have a relationship or to dance, they have the high, the women of the higher classes and at the bottom. So there is a disparity there. With regard to the question of the imperial, I think one explanation is the difference between settler community and uh, a, 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 man, a male community that goes back. So there is not like in, in India, you have a similar relationship with local women. But uh, I, I don't know enough about the subject to, to dwell on it deeper. I'd like to give the last gentleman the, the, the floor to raise a question. Thank you for a very interesting uh, discussion. I'll try to keep it really short. In the announcement, I was also mentioned uh, rape right, uh, against men, and I didn't hear anything being said, so that's like a very blind spot often. Uh, which, and I understand this for the research. I was also wondering, in terms of uh, rape as revenge, uh, Berlin might be an example, but other uh, examples, and also the religious context, because something that really perplexed me is what's happening, for instance, to the victims of ISIS, ISIS uh, Yazidi women, and that doesn't get any coverage or barely any coverage in the press, and that's happening right now. Uh, and I wonder what's it about, why, if you thought about these things. I think the rape of Yazidi women does get quite a lot of press coverage. I don't think it gets any less than the coverage of rape in, yeah. in general. If you look at the coverage of the, you know, the perpetrators and also the terrible word, but the jihadi bribes and the, the return to the, the children to the Netherlands, and they, you realize that these women are in the same camps, but there's none, hardly any coverage about that, and no support from the Dutch government, for instance, to to prosecute the rapes of, of uh, perpetrators of Yazidis. I, I don't understand that, and it's it's something that maybe. Yes, well, it could look into too. I'm sorry. I think I think it would be quite difficult for the Dutch government to prosecute the rape of people that have been raped in a different country that they don't have sovereignty over. But I mean that that is 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 something that is not necessarily going to be decided now. I mean, as the cases that we've looked at shown, sometimes it takes decades and decades and decades for these cases to come before a criminal court. And I think at the heart of this lies political prioritization. So I know that as a public, we have a kind of scale in which we expect that terrible things get an equal coverage. But when you turn it into actions, the considerations are what are our instruments, how can we intervene, what does the law say, what are our interests there, and then it's, you know, it's very pragmatic, so it's very often, I don't say I agree, but it's the social reality of, 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 of coverage of terrible things. Very briefly in response to your question about the rape of men, it is true. Uh, we were hoping to cover it, we ran out of time. Um, also, but more fundamentally, we have a problem of sources. So we have cases of men who are with objects in custody, um, but having any sources on that is extremely difficult to come by. And also, I mean, we have to underline that the rape of women takes place on a far greater scale as well. I have to finish the Q&A, uh, especially because we have some drinks and I would like to continue the, the discussion more on a more informal base. Um, the interesting for me that I at least would take away is the importance of these case studies, of all the details that you, that you point out to, that, that obviously leave us with some of the broader political, social, sociological and structural questions of, of what is underneath and how, how can we explain or how can we 
um, pre prevent things from happening again, but the details, the, yeah, the power is in the details, and I would like to thank you very much for your courage also to do research on this topic and to share this with us, and I would like to thank you all very much for coming and uh, engaging in this uh, debate. Let's go for a drink and talk uh, more. Thank you.